Welcome to American Muse Podcast, where we explore hidden secrets in the landscape of 19th and 20th century American orchestral music. Your host is Dr. Grant Gilman, conductor, violinist, and author based in Atlanta, Georgia. In each episode, Grant unearths a fresh orchestral work by an American composer you may not even know. And by the end, we hope you are a new fan of the composer and their music. Now, your host, Maestro Grant Gilman. Okay, our guest today on the American Muse podcast is the music director of the Baltimore Chamber Orchestra and frequent guest conductor all over the United States, Canada, and Europe. He spent 12 years as music director of the Duluth Superior Symphony Orchestra and over 20 years as co-director of graduate conducting at the Peabody Conservatory of Music, where I was his student for an all-too-short two years of my master's degree. He also repeatedly credited me with the brilliant inspiration to begin his own conducting workshops crafted to his mind-blowing conducting technique and life-changing philosophy of music making. He now holds forth multiple times a year, leaving an ever larger pedagogical mark on the conducting and musical world. Not content only to grace the world with excellent musical performances and preparing many generations of conductors to come, he has authored three books, Counterpoint Fundamentals of Music Making, Looking for the Harp Quartet, and Investigation into Musical Beauty, and most recently in 2016, On Principles and Practice of Conducting. For more on his current activities, you can find him on Facebook and his website, markhanthacker.com. Please welcome my teacher, mentor, and voice constantly in the back of my head, maestro Mark Ann Thacker. Welcome. Uh, Grant, thank you. I was wondering who you were talking about there for a minute. <laughs> but um, it's true that you were the you were the impetus behind me starting these uh, conducting workshops that I have been doing that have been really important to me for oh it's it's now it's just just over 10 years well i was only a maven it was an idea that already existed but without everything that you already had to say it was just it was just a manifestation of everything you had been doing it that you've been developing for yourself and for everybody else at peabody for such a long time well I, yeah i mean i hope i hope that I've like anyone. I, I hope that I've been able to make a little bit of a mark in this all too short life because it's all very short. I have to say, in the in both the best and the worst possible ways, you you got in my head from the very beginning, and also, of course, you know, I did my undergrad at Peabody, so so I was sitting in the conductor's orchestra playing. And and watching you work with all the other conductors, and I was like, "Those are they're all idiots. I can do it better than they can." But I was wrong. <laughs> but but, um, but I do remember that like very often, and certainly when I was a student, when I was a conducting student, like it was it was on a it was on a regular weekly basis. Every time you were there, you would say something or 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 express some kind of concept, and I was it was like something that especially if it was something that I hadn't thought of or it was contrary to something that I had heard before and believed before, then it got in my head and it was like, it was like a, a bad, a bad itch. That I had to, <laughs> I just, like now it still sticks in my head over and over and over again. I can't, I can't go to those concepts either musically or physically or whatever. And I can't, I can't not hear it because I, I, I'm not sure to be pleased or not to hear that. <laughs> it is it is only good. It's only good overall because because it's things that are absolutely true and they're things that people mostly don't think about. So so mostly what like you know being on the podium I'm not going to talk to an orchestra about technique. You know that's that's like they don't care and uh it's a waste of time but more importantly, it's that the technique is good so that they don't think about it at all, obviously. But but more importantly, it's that the musical ideas that you would talk about, I think the things that like stuck with me the most in that, that I use still continuously that's on the podium like that, besides the physical things, is this concept that, this is an oversimplification of, of your philosophy, but that that a tradition can be great if it's, uh, if it's, if it works. 
However, otherwise, a tradition is, is completely useless just because it's a tradition. So uh, something, you know, that we, we, you know, we now have tons and tons of recordings of people doing their version of whatever, from anything from Beethoven to, to Mahler and, and back and forth of, of taking a faster tempo here or, or a really big slowdown here, and none of it means anything. None of it is valid just because somebody else did it. And it wasn't that I had, didn't have that idea before, but I had all the same recordings that everybody else did. And I didn't have, you know, until I got to college, I didn't have an orchestra to practice with all the time. And then you get in front of the orchestra and then, you know, you try to do those same things and it doesn't necessarily work. And even if you do it, even if you make it happen, and, and not to go totally down this road too far, but like everybody makes a big deal and I'm going to get in trouble later because I am going to interview Mark Gibson, but um, here's this thing about like everybody knowing the Beethoven tempo markings from all the symphonies, right? So that's a typical thing, and, and Meyer was the same way. Gustav Meyer did the same thing. He wanted everybody to know the tempo markings. And then there, of course, there are plenty of conductors, it seems more recent, that like want you to take all of them. Absolutely. As if like it's like there's no question. He put them there, so you play all the notes, right? So you got to do the tempo markings, the metronome markings, and that's it. And I remember there was one workshop I was at, and the orchestra that we had was a very good orchestra, but we were doing this conducting workshop in a, uh, in a ballet studio, and it was enormous, and the echo was, the reverb was, was outrageous. It was n in no way suited for an orchestra to be in. And as large as the orchestra was, and we were doing Beethoven V or whatever, some, some Beethoven symphony, it was, we, we didn't even fill a quarter of the room. That's how big it was. And of course it sounded so booming. And so the conductor that was running the course was like, no, you have to take the Beethoven, you have to take the tempo mark. And of course it was way too fast for how much reverb was in the room. There was no way. And so finally, after Every conductor got up there and tried to go the tempo, and of course the orchestra couldn't go the tempo because you can't hear the notes at that tempo. You can't hear them in the proper proportion to each other. Um, he finally got up there and tried to do it, and it didn't work for him either. And I was like, "That's it. That's that's exactly right." Now, so now that's that's just an anecdote, but but for me, that's the things that I take forward uh, that you know in kind of a practical way you know, that I can still take to like a community orchestra, like an Alpharetta or, or to a, to a youth orchestra. And like in those rare moments where you can actually say something a little bit more than just rehearsing, that is that you don't take something for granted just because somebody else did it or just because it says one particular metronome marking or it says this or that. Only thing that matters is does it move you? And how do you get to that point in the way that we're doing it? And that's it. Yeah, and it's all about experience. So in terms of tempo and understanding that tempo is different from speed, tempo being the quality of motion, and it's a, it's a factor, as you're describing, it's a factor of how much, how much information you get in a given amount of time. So the more information you get in the same amount of time, the faster the quality of motion, in other words, the faster the tempo. So what is a metronome mark in a, in a resonant room or playing outdoors? You play at the same metronome mark and uh, one in the resonant room, you have much more information and it feels much faster. And therefore, since all we have is our experience, all we have is what it feels, it's faster. It's a faster tempo. Um, and by the way, those those Beethoven metronome marks, uh, you, you probably know how he came about putting those in. But he was it was eighteen seventeen. He was virtually completely deaf. He had his his crazy nephew sitting by him with a Melzel metronome that, that who and who knows how whether or not it has any accuracy. But much more importantly, he was deaf. He's banging away on the piano. What could he hear? There was no actual sound experience. And, and so I actually say that the metronome, it's the only indication <clears throat> in a score that's precise. The pitch is not precise. 
the volume is pr not precise, the rhythm is not precise, um, balances are, are not precise, the timbre is not precise. There's a range within which any one of those can fulfill the conditions. And so the only thing that's physically precise is this metronome number, and therefore it's irrelevant. Good. So, okay. So now let's go on to sort of going on to American music. We're not really going to talk about American music, but we'll, we'll go to it a little bit. So in our correspondence for this, um, being the starkly honest man that you are, you mentioned that you really aren't a fan. You're totally welcome to disagree with any of this, but you mentioned you really aren't a fan of American music. Now, I didn't take this to mean that you don't like any American music. And I know that there is some that you do like and enjoy. Uh, I'm betting there is some Bernstein in there, Gershwin, you did mention. Um, and at a concert you were conducting, uh, I won't mention the, the orchestra, but I was there. Um, I heard you talk about Copeland. I can't quite remember the piece. I think it might have been the Red Pony Suite. Um, you admitted to the audience you initially didn't connect with the piece, but eventually, after hearing it and listening to it and studying the piece and everything, you were drawn to it in a way that only Copeland can accomplish. So despite these obvious examples of the American orchestral canon, what is the reason for your reticence to the American sound? Are you sure that was me conducting at that concert? Absolutely sure. <laughs> you were uh, very sick. Oh. Yes. <laughs> um, okay. It probably wasn't Red Pony because I don't think I've ever conducted that. Maybe it was Tenderland. Anyway, uh, if I said that I'm not a fan of American music, I'm sure what I meant was I'm not a fan of Russian music. I'm not a fan of English music, French music. I'm not a fan of German music. I'm not a fan of Guatemalan music. I'm a fan of good music. And by that, I mean uh, music that does what music can do, which is, as you just touched on, under certain conditions of our ability to absorb the sounds and of and of conditions of, in fact, how those sounds come into life, it's possible to be moved. And so to the extent that um, and a composition can do that. Yeah, I, I value it. I mean, I, I happen to really appreciate the Copeland Third Symphony. It's, uh, but then is there any, well, I'll, I'll say, you know, American composers, I think Barber is not in the Pantheon. He's not, he doesn't reside right there next to Bach and Mozart. Beethoven, Mendelssohn and Schumann, a lot of Germans in there, German speakers. <laughs> okay with that. I'm, I'm good with that. Yeah. Um, but I think he's, he's close. He, he, he writes, some of his music is absolutely, well, we can say absolutely moving. Uh, if allows the possibility of a moving experience. I think Bernstein, I, I think uh, West Side Story is a work of genius. Um, I happen to think one of his best works is the Jeremiah Symphony. And I think otherwise his music went downhill from the age of 25 on. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> and by the way, I made my debut with the uh, with the New York Philharmonic with a work by John Adams. And I, and I made my, that was unscheduled. And I made my scheduled debut with music by Copeland. So, I mean, I'm, I'm happy with Copeland. Um, I think Gershwin, Barber, Copeland. W what is it that separates, and I'm talking about that pantheon. What is it that, that separates the music of Bach and Beethoven and Mozart and Schubert and, it's that it's that they allow every single tone to give meaning to every other so that we can be absorbed fully from beginning to end of a movement. And I don't wanna say 
Bernstein music doesn't do that. Uh, what I will say is I haven't experienced that in Bernstein music. I also don't think anyone else can to that degree, but that's the most I can say. But that's it's all the same issue of can this music, uh, does it allow me to, to bring to life this, these suggestions of tones in a way that can grab me, that can absorb me, that can, that, that in which I can lose myself. And in, in that losing myself, find the very essence of my being. That's, Brahms could do that. Mozart could do that. Debussy could do that. Barber somewhat, Tchaikovsky somewhat. All right, so let's let's st set the stage for this a little bit. So I'll I'll pick uh, something from uh, your book, uh, Looking for the Harp Quartet. You you say early on um, the ultimate experience of beauty is available from the most sublime performances of masterworks of Western art music. And of course, if we let this. If we let it, this can be quite a can of worms, that, that statement. But so let's unpack it a bit, uh, starting with the terminology. So Western art music is, of course, what most people casually call classical music, uh, which is only a specific era of music. So what does Western art music refer to? Um, and how did we come to call it classical as opposed to anything else? What, why does that become the main term that we use? Yeah, that... That I don't know, and it's good questions, and I'm not sure I've, sure I've actually thought about it thoroughly other than um, it's about intent. So the intent is for an aesthetic experience. Whereas I said Richard Rogers was a genius, but the intent of his music um, is not only a, a, an aesthetic experience, it's also a dramatic experience to the extent that uh, that West Side Story is really beautiful and moving. It also, the intent is uh, Broadway uh, drama. Now that you say that, I I'm going to, you're going to just remind me of everything that happened 15 years ago. Um, I think you were the first one that, that like crystallized that for me. Like, for example, the, the the easiest example for us that we, we do a lot of opera. I mean, we can do a, opera and there's tons of music and great music and opera. But the focus of opera is not the music. It's the drama. The drama leads everything. And the purpose of the music is to support the drama. It's to it's to enhance the drama. Yes. Yeah. Right. And I'd never quite thought about it that way before. So and that's that's fine. That, that does marginalize to an extent, the music, it doesn't make it any less good in its little bits, but at the same time, it does change it from what a symphony is, that a symphony in, in its best form is from beginning to end one thing, whereas well, in an opera, the drama is one thing from beginning to end, hopefully, and the music is to support that. And on its own, the music is not going to be one thing. Yes, and, and it's about... It's about our consciousness. So what is our consciousness in an opera? Our consciousness is, okay, here are these uh, these human conditions that are being played out on stage. And I recognize them. And there's also text and lyrics. And that has meaning to me. And, <clears throat> um, but I have to, be in that consciousness. When I talk about sublime performance, it's a performance that can engage me. There's, 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 it's, it's a sound object that I can absorb, take in, and lose myself in. And what I lose is that duality between me and this aesthetic object. And in that losing of myself, that's the, the, the touching of my essence. That's the touching of my soul. Is there, is there not Western art music that can do that to some extent? Yes, sure. And, and this, um, this notion of um, music that's 
internally coherent, that's internally meaningful, that every tone gives meaning to every other. Um, as far as I know, that's a Western concept. That's a Western European concept, which has come to us from our Western roots. But um, the, the Eastern music that I'm familiar with doesn't do that. It's a different aesthetic. Okay, so so th this was something that I never quite grasped. I heard you try to explain it a couple times, including once at William & Mary, about taste. So when someone says, it's not to my taste, or this is, it's just not something that I like, how does that, how does that fit in with what you're talking about? Because I agree with you, I think, that if you are human with ears and, and everything works, is working at least mostly properly, and that, that your mind is working at least in tangent with, with the ears and, and everything can take in the sounds as they're supposed to be taken in, then you have the possibility of being moved by the sounds. So that would negate the possibility, the, the, um, negate the argument that it has anything to do with taste. I would say that there is an objective possibility available from sounds. One of the, one of the three components of this highest possible experience is the listener's opener, openness to the sound. If, if being open to the sounds is one of those, those elements, going to the, to the composition side, what are, what are those other elements? What are some of those elements that contribute to that sublime, ultimate beauty? So ultimately, it's oneness. It's that the sounds can come to me as one so that I can absorb them in a single act of consciousness from the beginning of the movement to the end. And um, the controlling element of that is energy. Now, I hate this um, result of thinking about this in depth. I hate the result. But the result is that tonality allows that possibility because tonality you're in a certain key and then you move a fifth away and you've stretched and then you move another fifth away and you have stretched and you've increased the tension, increased the energy and built energy by stretching. And then you can return home. And in, in so doing, um, what you create is, is a dynamic structure, a structure of energy such that the energy you create you play out. And so one of the controlling elements uh, is that the energy and the music end at the same time. But if you don't have tonality as a basis, if you don't have an E major as the basis when you go to B and F sharp minor and C sharp minor, you that you've stretched and you built energy, you just have you have something and then you have something else and you have something else. And so a composer has fundamentally four tools, four tools to create energy. Volume, this creates energy. Bum, 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 bah, creates energy. Okay, creates energy with pitch. Bum, 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 bum. I, I can use pitch to, okay, create energy. Uh, composer can use rhythmic density, in other words, the closer together the the events, the tonal events, the more energy you create. So I've created energy. And the fourth tool is uh, harmony, both local and structural. Local being within a key and structural being within different keys. And so a, a non-tonal composer only has those three tools, volume, rhythmic density and tessitura pitch. So that, that makes a non-tonal composer's job much harder. So let's shift just a little bit. In your teaching, you begin and end with the effect of sound on the listener. Now, I know this firsthand. One way that uh, to summarize what I took from your teaching in this way is 
if the gesture doesn't intimately connect with the character of the sound on the level of the beat, it has no purpose. Um, but when it does connect, you become the sound, so to speak. So going back to this quote from your book, the, the ultimate experience of beauty is available from the most sublime performances of masterworks in Western art music. How do you approach teaching someone to a, attain such a lofty goal? It starts with the understanding that's different from the common understanding. There is a common understanding that <clears throat> we have an ensemble of 24 or 35 or 60 or 80 people. And so we have 24, 30, 65 different musical sensibilities. And so it's our job by the force of our personality to impose our will to galvanize these different sensibilities to our vision of the music. Right. And I think that's a fair encapsulation of people's understanding. Um, and what I would say is, uh, not so fast. <laughs> because look, um, here's something that I, I, I do. Okay, so what's the next note? Boom. What's the next note? Boom. What's the next note? Boom. Yeah, so, and I didn't tell you, I didn't say a word. Um, so you connected to the pulse, you connected to the volume, you connected to the inflection of volume. And the fact is that, um, yes, we absolutely, everyone has grown up in different place, different, has had different cultural influences, different parents, different sodas, drinking, whatever it might be, we're, we're very different people. But at the same time, there's something fundamental that carries across. So an ensemble that plays in tune, they don't play in tune because the conductor says, okay, you are three cents flat and you need to come down one cent. And they, they feel that, they hear that magical thing that coming together, that, that just this celestial balance and, 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 and combination and they find it and they do it. And similarly, the musicians understand the responsibility. So just like you sang, bom, bom, bom. So it's it's not then, my responsibility as a conductor is not to dictate, okay, now louder, ba, ba, now, ba. In that process, and that it, there, there is some understanding by a lot of people that that is a job as a conductor, um, then the responsibility of the musician becomes, what's the stick? Okay, so I got to follow the stick. The stick gets softer, so I play softer. But that's not a very good process for actually making beautiful music. And so if we understand, okay, palm, 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 then our job is to connect our gesture to the sound. In other words, be the music, be a physical manifestation of the sound to the extent that we can thereby empowering the musicians, thereby guiding them, influencing them, not to respond to my stick, but to respond to the demands of the sound. All right. I want to go back just a little bit. Just one other thing about um, pieces in general. We have this canon. I, I, I think I remember specifically you said once, we play music from a very small time period from a very small geographic area. And that's basically what we we play in orchestral music anyway. And that's what mostly what we concentrate on. And you were unapologetic about it for the, all of these reasons that we've talked about it. And, and, and I, I agree with that. That's not to say that there aren't other pieces that did exist or do exist that are also pieces of sublime beauty that don't get performed on a regular basis or at all or have been lost. So... In your estimation, what what are some of those reasons, both in, in Europe or in America or anywhere, um, that some of those pieces that are maybe not necessarily on the level of Brahms and Beethoven and Mozart that are the absolute best, but they are they're pretty close, if not you know getting there, 
that there are these pieces that absolutely can take you from beginning to end without without skipping one moment um, and take you and totally suck you in. How do these pieces get lost to, to the trash bin of history? Well, that starts with your assumption that there are such pieces. And there may well be, but I don't know that there are. And I would suggest if the question is, how do, piece, how do pieces get into the canon? Um, I think it's largely a meritocracy. We perform pieces uh, more frequently that do more for us. But Bach was, um, was not at the highest reputation uh, during his lifetime. And it wasn't until um, later on that little by little people began to realize, oh, wait a minute, this music does something for me. This music does something for me. And well, look, look at Mozart. Okay, so we value Mozart. Nobody listens to symphonies one through 24. No, why? They, they're not as good as 25, maybe the first one. And I don't know if I've ever heard 26 or 27. Uh, and then they don't get really good until 35, 36, 38, 9, 40, 41. And those are the ones that we hear. So it's, it's a meritocracy. Um, but yes, um, of course, the more you hear something, the more you're going to respond to it. But I don't think it's an accident that the Beatles are remain, their music remains popular and uh, Herman's Hermit's not so much. Well, thank you, Maestro, for joining me. And we'll, we'll definitely do this again. Uh, I'd love to. And uh, congratulations on the program. And glad to know everything's going well. Absolutely. Absolutely. We'll see you again. Take care. If you like what you have heard and want to support the advocacy of American orchestral music, please consider signing up to donate regularly at patreon.com for our continued production of this podcast. Also, subscribe for updates wherever you get your podcasts so you don't miss an episode.